Villains are the funnest characters to write. For me, there's really no contest. Maybe I just have a bad boy complex or something, but I can't seem to get enough of them, especially the really pathetic ones. Judge Frollo, Smeagol, Joffrey Baratheon, you know the type. The more impudent, sniveling, uncertain, flawed, the better. And it reaches a whole new level when they don't even come off that way to begin with. The discovery or the creation of that weakness in an otherwise powerful, competent villain is such an exciting moment for me. Which, in hindsight, could mean something weird about my psyche, but I can't help myself. Villains who are fragile on the inside are some of my favorite characters in fiction, period. And I think I may have found the grandfather of them, one of the oldest versions of this trope. You may even have heard of him before. A little old wizard from Russian folklore named Kashe the Deathless. A big thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video, but an even bigger thanks to the Tail Foundry Patreon community. Not only do all of you help keep this channel alive, but you've done so much to help make these videos too. All the input you give during our live chats and research sessions really does sculpt what we create. Sometimes you come up with stuff we never would have. Kashe the Deathless is one of those characters that's both really well referenced and at the same time, really sort of unknown. I don't think if you brought him up to the layperson they'd recognize him the way one might recognize, say, Darth Vader or Hades. But, of course, that doesn't stop creatives from putting him to work. Books like The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden, Deathless by Catherine M. Valenti, and Hellboy Darkness Calls by Mike Mignola have done some really amazing things with him. But then, you know, there's also stuff like the giant spider monster from The Witcher 3 that just happens to be called Akoshi, or the random viking in the MMORPG RuneScape. Surprisingly, he even shows up as a music-hating ogre-themed Russian nesting doll in the kids' show Little Einsteins. So, some of these are a little more accurate, some not so much. To really understand the character, you have to look at the role he plays in the stories he comes from. And it's folklore, so you know, there's a bunch. But I'll give you a quick rundown on the two most well-known versions. First, the death of Kashe the Deathless. In this classic fairy tale, Kashe is both a prisoner and a powerful wizard. The story really begins when our hero, Ivan Sarovich, is left alone in his wife's palace while she's out warring, you know, like you do. It's interesting, they sort of treat it like she's just out getting groceries or something. He's given run of the house, allowed to go anywhere he pleases, except for one closet. She tells him that he must not, under any circumstances, open that one door. Of course, as soon as she's gone, guess what he does. Inside, he finds an old, emaciated man, bound up with twelve great chains. The man begs him for water, saying he hasn't had anything to eat or drink in ten years. Against his better judgment, without bothering to consult his wife, Ivan brings the man one bucket full of water after another, which he gulps down. After the third, his strength returns to him. He breaks the chains easily and reveals that, who guessed it, he is actually the powerful wizard, Kashe the Deathless. After giving Ivan his thanks, he departs in a whirlwind and kidnaps Maria Morevna, Ivan's wife. As you'll see, it's different in other stories, but this time around, most of Kashe's evil and longevity can be attributed to his incredible magical stallion. Every time Ivan manages to rescue his wife, the horse alerts Kashe about it, and when Kashe asks whether they can still catch the two, the horse assures him that they could grow fresh crops, reap them, turn them into food, enjoy it, and still run them down with plenty of time to spare. That's how fast it is. Three times Ivan rescues his wife, and three times Kashe steals her back. The first two times, he spares Ivan's life as a return gesture for the buckets of water Ivan gave him. He warns that on the third attempt, he'll cut Ivan into pieces, seal him into a barrel, and throw him into the sea. And that's exactly what he does. But with the help of his powerful wizard brothers-in-law, Ivan is reassembled and resurrected. He returns one more time to save his wife, and this time the couple takes a different approach. Instead of running away together, which is doomed to fail anyway, Maria Morevna tricks Kashe into telling her how he got his horse. Turns out, it was given to him as a reward by a powerful Baba Yaga for managing the impossible task of caring for her herd of mares 
for three whole days. Ivan sets out to do the same, but gets pretty hungry along the way and considers eating a bird that he comes across, as well as a honeycomb and a lion cub, I guess. Okay, Ivan, reasonable. But he chooses not to eat any of them, and that turns out to be a good thing, because later on, when he's trying and failing to perform the witch's impossible task, flocks of birds, swarms of bees, and ferocious lions emerge from the wilderness to help him. They drive the mares back into their stable, which means against all odds, Yvonne has succeeded. In her typical way, Baba Yaga tries to kill him anyway, but he gets his magical stallion in the end and races off to rescue Maria once and for all. This time, Kashe's horse is not so sure they'll be able to catch up, but with the hubris of his long life, the wizard pursues anyway. He does manage to reach them, only for Yvonne's horse to kick his head in. The couple finish him off with a club, burn his body to ash, Maria takes his precious stallion, and the two ride off together into the sunset. So, like I said, the horse is really key to this story. Kashe is protected and enabled by his ability to run. As soon as Yvonne gets a magical horse of his own, it's over for the old wizard. There's a lot more to it, and I definitely recommend giving the full version a read for yourself, but we begin to see a theme emerging here. And although it's very different, the second version of the story I want to share with you does a lot to build on that theme. Sarovich Peter and the Wizard is probably my favorite story that Kashe shows up in, and you're about to see why. This time around, he's the most powerful wizard alive, unchallenged not because of the speed of his horse, but because of his sheer might. He doesn't need a Baba Yaga's help. His fortresses are built at the peaks of the highest mountains, ringed by three rivers, guarded by three monstrous ferrymen who demand your life and limb as a toll to cross. As if that weren't enough, his palace itself is encircled by an enormous sleeping serpent. However, when the hero's mother is kidnapped by Kashe, he learns that none of these are the wizard's true strength. Through a lot of cunning and bravery and sheer force of will, Peter manages to get by all these defenses only to find that the wizard is, of course, unkillable. All he can do after his grand adventure getting into the palace is hide in fear behind his mother's skirts. Luckily, just like Maria Morevna in the first story, Peter's mother is smart enough to trick Kashe into revealing his weakness. His life is not actually in his body, but hidden away someplace else. At first, he tells her it's inside of a broom. When she tries to honor his life by covering it in jewels, he tells her that it was a lie and that his life is actually hidden in the garden hedge. Again, she attempts to honor him, this time by covering the hedge in gold coins. So moved by this show of devotion is the wizard that he finally reveals the truth. His life is hidden inside an egg, and that egg is inside of a duck, and that duck inside of a hare, and that hare inside a great hollow log, and that log is floating in a pond on an island far away. So, unfazed, our hero travels back through all the dangers and ventures out to find it. Similar to the first story, along the way he saves several animals. A bear trapped under a fallen tree, an otter caught in a snare, a hawk tangled up in vines, a pike suffocating on dry land. Later, it's the bear who helps him split open the hollow log, the otter who catches the hare as it tries to run away, the hawk who snatches the duck mid-flight, and the pike who retrieves the duck's fallen egg from the sea and returns it to Peter. Finally, he returns to save his mother. Just as Kashe is about to strike him dead, he reveals the egg which holds the wizard's life. It's like a voodoo doll to him, whipping him about the room as Peter tosses it from hand to hand. Finally, with one swift motion, he dashes it against the ground, and that is the end of Kashe the Deathless. As in many other stories, they burn the body and return home with the wizard's treasure better off than they started. So, I said there was a lot more to the first story, the death of Kashe the Deathless. Well, I really just scratched the surface of Sarovich Peter and the Wizard. Read the original. You're missing out on palaces of copper, silver, gold, and pearl, three beautiful maidens, two useless elder brothers, and much else beside. But the reason I wanted to share both of these stories is because, in all the ways they differ, they do share a theme. Here's this powerful wizard whose entire life and magic is wrapped up in one small thing, a horse, or even more, a fragile little egg. 
we could just take this as an interesting figure in Russian folklore and call it a day. This is the thing Kashe the Deathless does. Great. Interesting character. But that wouldn't really be accurate. This is actually a thing in a lot of folk stories, extending far, far beyond Russian tradition. In fact, it's so common that folklorists have even given this sort of story a title. And it's a very creative title. The Monster with His Heart in the Egg. According to the book Folktale by Stith Thompson, versions of the story have been collected everywhere from Ireland to India some 250 times. That's a pretty big number across a pretty wide variety of people. The stories aren't always exactly the same, of course. Sometimes the egg becomes a bird or an insect or a needle, and often Kashe is just a generic giant or ogre. But this idea of a dangerous villain entrusting their life to some small protective measure which really just gives them a false sense of security... I mean, for it to be so prevalent, it's got to mean something, right? We even see it in our fiction today. Maybe the easiest example of this is Lord Voldemort from Harry Potter. An evil wizard who breaks up his soul and hides the pieces away in trinkets and doodads all over the place. Yeah, that about hits the mark. But beyond the superficial similarity, Voldemort has a really interesting trait which I think is actually pretty telling for this archetype. He is desperately afraid of death. He'll bring any number of curses or horrors down upon himself rather than face it. In J.K. Rowling's own words, Voldemort's fear is death, ignominious death. I mean, he regards death itself as ignominious. He thinks that it's a shameful human weakness. His worst fear is death. Which actually makes me think of another really interesting modern take on this story, the Lich. There's a lot of these in media, and we should probably do a video on them at some point, but suffice it to say that they're generally wizards who have used dark magic to reanimate themselves after death. Most often, they'll do this with the use of objects called phylacteries, which harbor some fragment of their life, soul, or power outside of their body and allow them to reclaim it after death. I really like this version of the archetype because the theme is so strongly represented by it. The Lich is a hideous monster undead. Maybe they've bought themselves eternal life, but what kind of life is it? Do you remember at the beginning of the video when I was talking about delightfully pathetic villains? Well, this is what I meant. And although he's not quite a lich, Kashe the Deathless and all the other monsters with their hearts locked away in eggs have done something similar to the lich. They've given up their hearts, their lives, so that they can live. Imagine the amount of fear that would drive someone to do something like that the blindness it would take to commence this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm sure Kashe wouldn't die so easily in these stories if he wasn't willing to entrust his whole life to an egg or the speed of a horse, but he does. And for all his power, succumbing to fear in that way, letting it rule him, handing himself over like a willing captive, that in itself is sort of like dying. And it's really relatable too. Humans do this. I do this. Fear really can make you irrational and drive you to do the strangest things. There are certainly people out there who spend so much of their life worrying about the worst possible outcomes, they end up forfeiting everything that would have made their life worth living anyway. They become paralyzed, obsessed, entrapped by their fears. And in extreme cases, they might even draw a false sense of security from these reactions. As if instead of losing everything to their fear, they've gained something. A promise as fragile as an eggshell. If these stories tell us nothing else, it's that submission to fear does not pay. Think about the bravery of the heroes, how things turned out so much better for those who would rather face death, literally rather be chopped into pieces in some cases, than give in to their fear. To be clear, I'm not trying to make a moral judgment here or telling you how to live. Really, this is just a great source of motivation for characters. So often villains are just psychopathic or extremely selfish, but sometimes, really, they're just afraid and maybe a little deluded about how to remedy their fears. So if this inspires you, go out there and create some real, pathetic villains. I can't wait to see what you come up with. And that would be where the video ends, except I have more to say. There are a number of interesting side notes and versions of the story I actually had to trim out of the script for time, but I couldn't quite let them all go. 
I had to keep a full version of the video out there somewhere. It seemed right. Luckily, there is a place where we can share that stuff, where we don't have to worry about streamlining our content so that it's a perfect fit for attention spans and algorithms. I'm talking about our new streaming platform, Nebula. YouTube is a weird place for educational content. It's hard to be as honest and open as you want while trying to satisfy the algorithm and trying to dodge some kind of terrible fate like channel-wide demonetization. So, a bunch of us educational creators got together and made our own platform where we don't have to worry about all of that. You can find all of our videos there ad-free and full of additional content we normally have to cut out for YouTube, including the extended version of this video. And we are not the only ones. The same is true for so many other amazing creators. It's a safe haven for the material we wish we could share here. And the best part is you don't even actually have to pay for Nebula if you don't want to. The good people at CuriosityStream want to make sure we indie creators will always have this special space, so they've decided to foot the bill for Nebula for anyone who wants to sign up with them. Get a year of CuriosityStream and you get a year of Nebula for free. If you like highly produced documentaries, and I mean really highly produced, this beats just about anything you could find on Netflix, I cannot recommend CuriosityStream enough. It's got thousands of titles, including videos about everything from prehistoric aquatic monsters to the cutting edge of modern science. And if you're still itching for more folklore and mythology after watching this video, they've got you covered. One of my favorite documentaries on the platform, Monsters and Myth, is all about classic monsters like dragons and cryptids and the cultures they've come from. Turns out, there's a surprising amount of truth behind some of our favorite monsters. Tail Foundry videos are a starting place for your imagination, but watch this documentary and you will have so much more to work with. I promise. They've also done their best to make it all accessible, too. Tail Foundry fans who sign up for a year of access now will save 26% on their subscription. That's just $14.79 a year. Not per month, per year, for both Curiosity Stream and Nebula, which is a ridiculous price for a streaming service. Click the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash tailfoundry and use the code tailfoundry to get access to both streaming services for less than $15 a year. And that's it for this video. There's usually a few weeks between uploads, so if you want more Tailfoundry in the meantime, come join our community. We have a Discord server that's basically like a big family of creatives, a lot of love there. We also run a writing group on Twitch every week if you want to get some practice in. You can find links to all of it in the description. Hope to see you there! Until then, thanks for watching, and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next time. Bye!